Good evening. How's everybody? Good, good. It's been a beautiful day, hasn't it? All right, let's go through some our prayer concerns and pray to start with, and then we'll get started with our Bible study. Good to see all of you here. So um, we're still praying for Lacey Petty, who's recovering from his ribs, and Braley Holcomb, great-granddaughter of George and Jeanette Bill with a, a kidney infection. You got an update? They're home. She's home. Oh, good. Uh oh. They're doing a seven day whatever. I'm not sure. Kind of. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then uh, we have on here uh, Elizabeth Tizer. Tizer, Nancy Dunn's mom. And uh, it's not on here, but uh, Juanita Hall's son, Larry, uh, is in the hospital. He has cancer and out of control cancer but now he has COVID and is at UNC Chapel Hill and, and looks pretty grim uh, and um, she's she's hard to upset and uh, she's she's a tough bird uh, but she you know it's, it's all getting to her a little bit this will be her third son to pass away and so um, be thinking of Juanita as well as her son Larry uh, any others that you'd like for us to, to point out and pray for specifically tonight Yeah. Okay. So Jeff, we'll we'll keep praying for Jeff. Okay. Anybody else? What's his name? Okay. All right. God knows. Okay. Others? Okay. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, we thank you for your wonderful love and your grace and your mercy. And we thank you for our time together and get to study your word together and share our lives together, encourage each other, lift each other up, support each other, pray for each other. And so we, we just are, are so thankful to you for, for those freedoms and those privileges that, that we get to, to do that. Uh, Lord, you see all that's on our prayer list, but we definitely want to to lift up this gentleman uh, with COVID and leukemia, and that you would provide healing for that situation and, and peace for that situation. Uh, we pray for Jeff, continue to pray for Jeff, that you would provide healing in his situation. And Lacey, as he continues to recover, and little Braley Holcomb, we just pray that you would give, them, give the doctors discernment uh, of what's going on and what's causing this infection and help just give them wisdom of, of the best ways to treat it. But we pray for your healing hand to, to touch her. And we pray for Nancy Dunn's mom. And we definitely pray for uh, Larry Hall and for Miss Juanita, uh, that you would provide healing and comfort and hold them up with your amazing grace. And so we, we pray for our time together tonight, that as we spend this time together, that, that we would have just a strong awareness that you are here with us, uh, and speak to our hearts through your word and through your spirit. Illuminate your word for us. And um, we just, uh, our, our heart's desire is to grow closer and closer and closer to you. And so uh, help us to achieve that tonight as we spend this time together and with you. So we love you so very much. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. So I'm thinking... If you will be patient with me, 
uh, that we'll finish up our first doctrine tonight, uh, the doctrine of the Bible. I might go over my normal time frame, uh, but since we don't have choir practice tonight, I, I hope that you'll let me indulge and go ahead and try to wrap up this part four uh, of the doctrine of the Bible. And so um, before I get started, let me pass out the forms for tonight. And so we have, does anybody need the part three of the study that we finished up last week? Okay. So this is going to be part four, if you'll get that passing around. And then right after that, if this is going to be our comparisons of the doctrine of the Bible uh, with some other groups. So if you'll get that one passing around. And who said they needed the part three? I need. need one? All right. Want one too, or you share? All right. Did anybody else say something? Part three. Okay. So as you know, we're going through the, the study called Foundations, uh, where we're looking at 11 major doctrines of the Christian faith. Uh, the whole point of this is to help us to develop a biblical worldview, that we actually uh, know what the Bible says about important issues of our lives, and that we um, live by the Bible. That's the, the whole point of, of studying uh, this kind of doctrinal study. The first one we looked at was on the Bible, the doctrine of the Bible. Uh, our main objective has been to deepen uh, our conviction that the Bible as God's word can be trusted. Uh, we, we've been looking at three major words through the whole campaign and guiding our study. The first one was revelation. The second one was inspiration. third one was illumination. And under revelation, we asked, how do we know the Bible came from God and answered that? We asked, how do we know we have all the right books of the Bible? And answered that. Under inspiration, we defined what inspiration means and, and what, it, what it means for us, the implications for us. Uh, and then we turned to illumination a couple few weeks ago. Uh, God wants to illuminate, to light up his word for us so that we know what it means and how it applies to our lives, how it impacts and fits into our lives. Uh, the life change objective for that section was to, to give us deep and lasting confidence in our God-given ability to understand the Bible. And so we've been talking about how there's four things necessary for illumination to happen in our lives. Number one, we must love God's Word deeply. Uh, if we're not interested in God's Word in the least, then we're not going to study it. We're just not going to invest into it. And so we need to pray that God would give us a greater and greater and greater love for his word. Second, we must understand God's word spiritually. It's not just an intellectual exercise. Uh, a lot of things in the Bible have to be uh, illuminated for us through the Holy Spirit's help, not just intellectually. Uh, and then third, uh, we must handle God's word accurately. And we looked at seven uh, rules for Bible study last week. Uh, faith and the Holy Spirit are necessary for proper interpretation. The Bible interprets itself. Uh, understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. Understand unclear passages in light of clear passages. Understand words and verses in the light of their context. Uh, understand historical passages in the light of doctrinal passages and understand personal experiences in the light of Scripture. So those were some rules for Bible study. So this evening, let's look at the fourth thing that's necessary for illumination to happen, for us to better understand the Bible, and that is we must study God's Word diligently. It takes diligence to study God's Word because the payoff doesn't always come immediately. Sometimes God wants us to process for a little bit. 
uh, before he gives us the, the light of what it means. And so we have to put some work into it. We have to put some effort into it. We have to put some thought into it. Howard Hendricks talks about the different stages that we go through in Bible study. He wrote, he said in Psalm, Psalm 1910, says that the scripture is sweeter than honey. But you never know that, judging by some believers. You see, he says, there are three basic kinds of Bible students. There are the castor oil types. To them, the word is bitter, yuck. But it's good for what ails them. Then there's the shredded wheat type. To them, scripture is nourishing but dry, like eating a bell of hay. But the third kind, he says, is what I call the strawberries and cream folks. They just can't get enough of the stuff. How did they acquire that taste? By feasting on the word. They have cultivated an insatiable appetite for spiritual truth. So our commitment to reading God's word is always rewarded, but typically diligence comes first. We have to put some effort into it. Uh, we, we have to put some time and energy into it. So I don't know about you, but it's, it's easier for me to talk about having diligence than it is to actually have diligence, to actually be diligent. So how do we bridge that gap between our desire to study God's word and our actual decision uh, to, to actually dedicate time and effort to dig out the truth of the Bible? Uh, how do you decide to study God's word as a lifetime commitment? So this evening, let's look at four helpful hints that, that hopefully we can engage in that will help us to be more diligent uh, in our study of the Bible. So the first one is vow before the Lord to trust in and to commit to the truth of his word. Go into it with the mindset that this is absolute truth and I am going to base my life on it and I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to live by it. You make up your mind ahead of time uh, that, that this is authoritative for my life, this is important for my life and you vow to the Lord that you're going to trust it and you're going to commit yourself to, to, to knowing it and living it. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. So you might have some doubts about God's word and, and different things in the Bible. You might ask sometimes, can I really trust it? Well, in this whole study that we've covered with the doctrine of the Bible, uh, we've seen the proof of history uh, that, that we can trust the Bible. We've seen the uh, reality of changed lives that we can trust the Bible. But the, the flat out bottom line truth is this, trusting in God's word comes down to being a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. In faith, we must consciously decide to trust the truth of God's word. Uh, well, have, have you done that already in your life? Have you decided that, uh, you remember I gave an illustration a couple few weeks back about Billy Graham uh, having some doubts and, and going out into the woods to kind of make peace with, 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 with all of his view of the Bible and what God wanted him to do. And, and out in the woods, God laid it on his heart that he just has to put his faith in it. Uh, and believe it, and to live by it, and, and that guided Billy Graham's life, well, we have to do the same thing. Uh, we have to decide at some point, hopefully if you haven't done it already, then right here, right now, this evening, to, to decide that you can trust the truth of God's Word. So before you ever go into reading it, it's an attitude thing, it's a commitment thing, vow to the Lord uh, of how you're going to look into it, that you trust it, and that you're committed to it. Uh, second uh, idea Cultivate your eagerness for studying God's Word and your love for God's Word by examining God's Word for answers. In Acts 17.11, uh, we're told, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, 
For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So I want you and me, oops, sorry, I don't, I hit something, I guess, sorry. I want us to be like the Bereans. Don't just take anything you hear uh, from any of your Sunday school teachers or anybody else or from me even at face value. Uh, dig into God's word for yourself. Go into it prayerfully asking God to give you wisdom and discernment and understanding. And so be like the, the, the Bereans. Uh, as soon as they heard the word from Paul, they went back to the Bible themselves to confirm uh, if what he was saying was true and consistent with God's word. And so when you have a question, whether it's a question in life or a question that, that something I say or one of your teachers say or something you read or something you hear on TV or in the news or in the world. If you have a question, go to the Bible. Let that be your first response to go to the Bible for its perspective, for its truth on the matter and search it out. Uh, if you don't have some kind of uh, Bible study uh, app on your phone or on your computer or some kind of commentary book or something, uh, you can come to me anytime and I would share with you the resources I have uh, and, and talk to others uh, about what your questions are. But ultimately, you want to dig into God's word for that answer. And, and ultimately, God, since he's the giver of truth, he's going to, to help us to understand that in time. Now, like I said, it might take work. It might take time, it might take effort, it might take some digging, it might take a lot of prayer. But we go to the Bible and we search, and when God shows us the truth of that and gives us the answer to that, it brings a joy like you'll never know, uh, or like you've never known, uh, that, that God has, has answered your question and it will give you a trust for how he uses and works uh, through the Bible in your life and in your growth. And so uh, we cultivate eagerness by examining God's word for answers to the idea. Tell others what you're learning from God's word. And I, I think this is really, really, really important uh, for us to do. Uh, I, I hope that in our Sunday school classes in particular, since they're more intimate, uh, more uh, a format where we should be able to share with each other, uh, I hope that you're able to do that in your Sunday school classes, uh, that, that you can share with each other how God is, is teaching you uh, through your devotions or through the particular lesson that you're studying that day that, that you can share with each other. Uh, we see in Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And so you see in this verse, there's an expectation that, that we're helping each other to understand. We're sharing with each other what we're learning and, and, and trying to help each other to grow and come to that, uh, to more wisdom and, and uh, living by God's word. Oops, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, this will keep you from growing stagnant in your faith. I, I don't know about you, uh, but I know that there have been seasons of my life and it's embarrassing to say this, but there's been seasons in my life where I just felt like I wasn't getting anything out of God's word. Uh, that, that I was, I really hate to say this, that I was bored with it, if you will. And so maybe you've had gone through seasons like that yourself where uh, you, you spend a little bit of time in it, but you don't feel like God's speaking to you through it. Uh, and so... Um, Part of the answer to, to overcome that is um, to, when you're thinking about it and when you get that nugget of truth, share it with somebody. Process it out loud. Uh, have a friend, an accountability partner, or somebody that you can uh, just share with, that, that you can say, you know, the, uh, I read this morning, blah, 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 and I, I was thinking about this, and, and, and share with each other. So in Israel, there are two C's. Uh, in the north is the Sea of Galilee, and in the south, there's the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee 
is beautiful and lush and full of life. And it's a, a popular vacation spot because it's so beautiful and so teeming with fish and, and life. Well, the Dead Sea, on the other hand, is called dead for a good reason. Uh, it is so filled with minerals that nothing can live in it. Uh, nothing can live in it. So what's the difference between the Sea of Galilee, which is so beautiful, and the, and the Dead Sea, which uh, is, is kind of miserable? Well, the difference is the Sea of Galilee, the waters that are coming out of the mountains and into the, saddle, into the Sea of Galilee have an outlet. They go back out through the Jordan River. And so water is like constant motion uh, of coming in and going out, coming in, going out. The Dead Sea, on the other hand, has no outlet. And so all the minerals that are coming out of the mountain and into the Dead Sea just stay there. And it suffocates any possible life that could live there. And so these two seas, the, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, are a good parable for our lives. Uh, if you only take God's word in, you'll soon find yourself growing stagnant in your faith. Uh, even the most exciting truths in the Bible uh, will seem stale. So it is as you share the truth with others that you will be continually refreshed and inspired by the word. So we, we tell others what we're learning. And then a, a fourth way, a fourth idea uh, is to act on what you learn as you study the Bible. Uh, James challenged in James 1.22, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And so uh, the Bible is not just good literature. It is good literature, but it's not just good literature. The Bible is God's perfect guidebook for living. Uh, it's not just a good book to be read. It's a practical book to be lived. And so as, as you feel like you're reading a, a passage uh, that has some kind of command or, or some kind of exhortation, uh, our, our goal should be to try to live that out. Uh, the Bible says to, to love others. We should do our best to love others. Uh, the Bible says don't judge. We should do our best not to judge. And, and, and so be it through that. And so we act on what we learn uh, in, our, in our study of the Bible. And so that should help, those four things should help us to gain diligence uh, in our Bible study, which should lead to uh, God uh, lighting up his word for us, illuminating his word for us. And so how I'd like to finish this section uh, is to look at how some other religious groups view the Bible. And so I started out, uh, you'll see on your sheet, uh, 1963 Baptist Faith and Message and 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. I'm not sure how familiar you are with those documents, uh, but those have been put out by the Southern Baptist Convention as our doctrinal statements. And, and the year listed there is the year that, that it came out. And so 1963 Baptist Faith and Message came out in 1963 and and it served as the primary doctrinal statement for the, Southern, for the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention uh, up until 2000. And then it was edited, and so uh, that version is the, the newer one. Now, however, um, because of the way the Southern Baptist Convention works, uh, each Baptist church is an autonomous unit that can do however we want. And so some churches still... Uh, abide more by the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message than by the 2000, which um, the vast, vast, vast majority of the two are the same uh, with just some changes. Well, uh, this section on the doctrine of the Bible is one of the, the sections where we see just a little bit of difference. And so um, uh, let, let me kind of read through the 1963 one. And by the way, according to our bylaws, uh, we abide by the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message. We, uh, we've we never, well, at least not according to the bylaws. I, I, I haven't heard it history-wise. Uh, we've never updated to the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. So we're still 1963. Uh, but like I said, they're, they're basically the same. So let, let me read the 63 version. 
And, and then I'll read the 2000 version. So this is the section on the Bible in the Baptist Faith and Message. The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is the record of God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It reveals the principles by which God judges us, and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. The criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. So that's the 1963 version. Now what I want you to do, um, I, I'm going to read the 2000 version next, but I want you to follow along the 63 version that we just read. So I think that will help you to notice where the differences come in. So as I'm reading, you kind of uh, read through the 63 version. Okay, so this is the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message statement on the Bible. The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony to Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. And so the, you hopefully can kind of see some of the um, additions or some of the rewordings of that. So any impressions of, of of why those differences were added, any impressions of, or anything that stuck out to you, wondering why would what why would they change that wording or why would they add that wording? Uh, as I read those two, anything stick out? I don't think it redefined anything in the changes that were made. Maybe just uh, emphasized something here or there more, uh, but um, rough, roughly the same. You, you still get the idea that within. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, the, the Bible is, is very, 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 very important to our Christian life and to our beliefs, okay? I, I know putting you on the spot like that, you had not had time to process it, but uh, you have it in front of you and take it home to process. So, um, okay, so let's, let's consider what Islam says about the Bible, uh, what the, the Muslims say about the Bible. And so the prophet Muhammad, which is the, the primary founding prophet of Islam, the prophet Muhammad preached that Allah, their word for God, their concept of God, had sent many prophets from Adam to Abraham to Moses to Jesus with the same message to each of their peoples. But Muhammad also preached that those messages of the prophets had been corrupted over time by their followers and that he himself brought the corrected and true message of Allah to be established in Islam. Uh, in other words, he had, a, he had the, the, the truer reality about it. He had the corrections about what went wrong and was corrupted through the years of the Bible. So the classical Quranic teaching about the Jews and Christians uh, is that they are the people of the book. Uh, Islam recognized the importance of the Bible to Jewish people and to Christians. Uh, Muhammad basically indicates that he built upon the truths of the Torah and the Gospels, corrected the corruption in the former books, and came out with the perfect Quran. 
In fact, uh, in many places, the Quran actually um, copies Bible statements word for word. Uh, in many places, it contradicts Bible statements as, as well. Uh, but it, it kind of started there and then changed things up. So the Quran, not the Bible, the Quran is considered by Muslims to be the perfect word and revelation of God, or Allah, uh, not the Bible. So they, they might be familiar with it, but they're not going to spend time reading the Bible. They're going to spend time uh, in, the, in the Quran. Uh, Mormonism. Do any of you have any Mormon friends or Mormon family or familiar with any, anybody who's, who's Mormon? Is there a Mormon church here nearby somewhere? Is there a Mormon church in town somewhere? I bet you anything there's one in Sanford. I don't, I don't know that I've come across one in Siler City or not. But according to Mormonism, the Bible is true only as far as it does not agree or does not disagree rather with Mormon doctrine. Uh, it is the only book of the four Latter-day Saint scripture. So uh, we consider the Bible to be our scripture. The Mormons have four books that they consider scripture. The Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and a corrected version of the Bible. Uh, and so of their four, the Bible is the, the only one that's accepted with limitations they say it's filled with alleged errors and omissions and that it cannot be trusted by itself. Yet, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints strives to legitimize itself by using and quoting the Bible in order to appear like other mainstream Christian denominations. So they, they want to come across as, as another Christian denomination and they use a lot of the same language as we do. Uh, but if you ever dig into Mormonism, you'll see that all of their terms that might be the same as ours have different meanings behind them. And so they, they speak a good, a good Bible talk, a good Christian talk, but it's different. Their, their meanings are different. And so for them, the Book of Mormon is their final authority, not the Bible, even though the Bible is considered one of four of their scriptures. Okay? Jehovah's Witnesses. Do any of you have any Jehovah's Witness family or friends or neighbors or know anybody? And so uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, say that the entire Bible was inspired by God, and they say that they believe all of it. However, they teach that the Bible cannot be taken literally, but must be illuminated by the Watchtower Society, their, their main political, administrative, um, leadership kind of group, the Watchtower Society. So Bible study to them means an examination of Watchtower literature. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses are discouraged from reading the Bible. Uh, they teach that only a small portion of the Bible was written for the average Jehovah's Witness. Therefore, they have no reason to read it. To support their views, the Watchtower Society often takes Scripture completely out of context, and the Watchtower Society developed its own translation of the Bible, the New World Translation, or NWT, because other translations contradicted their teachings and pointed out their differences from, from mainline Christianity. Therefore, when it comes to the doctrines which they deny, they deliberately change the text of their version of the Bible to conform with their beliefs. Uh, in reality, the Watchtower publications are more important to them than the Bible. So the Watchtower uses only about 6% of the Bible in its publications. So once again, there's a, a, a Bible claim but their, their actual practices don't really include a whole lot of thought about the, the Bible. And universalism. Uh, I, it was weird. And I, I, with universalism or Unitarian universalism, I, I usually think of big cities uh, that, that would have a church like that. Uh, but in my first church outside of Clinton, North Carolina, out in the, out in the sticks, there was actually a, a universalist church. And so uh, that's, uh, that gave me interest in studying what universalism says. 
So Unitarian Universalists generally don't hold the Bible in very high regard. Um, they acknowledge some inspiring thoughts in the Bible, but most view it as a fallible human book that is imperfect and that can hardly contain the actual words of Jesus. Uh, they consider the Gospels to be heavily influenced by the theological biases of the Gospel writers. Further, they hold that the Bible as a whole is unscientific, mythological, uh, and thus not to be interpreted literally, full of primitive ideas, permeated with ethical bar barbarisms, and loaded with excessively strict rules. And further, they hold that the Bible is certainly not unique or exclusive, uh, and they would see, uh, they would uh, consider the Hindu Vedas and the Muslim Quran as just as valid to them as the Bible. And so, it's weird, from what I've understood with universalists, any given universalist church can pretty much believe whatever they want to believe. Whichever religion they want to lean towards, they can lean towards. So uh, one might actually focus more on the Bible, but one might completely uh, not acknowledge the Bible at all. And so it, it depends, but in, in general, they don't have a very high view of the Bible. So let me close... Uh, with a, uh, just a, a little thought here. Uh, G.K. Chesterton was one of the great Christian minds of the early 20th century. Uh, he had a way with words not unlike Mark Twain. Uh, for instance, he once wrote, uh, The Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because they are generally the same people. So he kind of had a, a funny way with words, but he was kind of uh, very insightful. And so one time, Chesterton was asked what one book he would want to have with him if he were stranded on a deserted island. Uh, everyone, of course, expected him to say, the Bible, uh, and with a, a wonderful, witty explanation why. Uh, his surprising and exceedingly sensible answer was... Thomas's Guide to Practical Shipbuilding. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you're stuck on a, on a deserted island, be able to make a boat and make your way home. Uh, well, uh, in a sense, in a weird sense, we are all stranded on this island we call planet Earth. Uh, we long for the day when we get to go home to heaven, to be with God. But we are not there yet. So while we wait, while we're here on this world, on this, this island, God has given us an amazing gift, the Bible, the one book we need, a book that gives us hope, a book that gives us direction, a book that shows us what to do to safely get home. And so it, it, just like uh, he said for the, the guide to shipbuilding, uh, it helps us to get to our, the Bible helps us to get to our true home uh, by putting our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So let me wrap up with some central truths to remember. Uh, number one, the Bible, as God's Word, can be trusted more than your feelings. It can be trusted more than your values. It can be trusted more than your opinions. And it can be trusted more than anything that you're going to hear in this culture around us. The Bible itself is trustworthy and dependable. Number two, you can have deep and lasting confidence in your God-given ability as a Christian who is filled with the Holy Spirit and your God-given ability to understand the Bible. And so if you're truly a Christian, and you truly have the Holy Spirit inside of you, with Him, you can understand the Bible. Now, it might take work, it, might take, it definitely takes diligence and time and thought and energy and processing and all of that, but you can understand. Number three. Um, these, are, these are the, true, the three... Um, catchy doctrinal phrases we were trying to memorize along the way. The first one has to do with learning it or understanding the truth. The Bible 
is God's perfect guidebook for living. That one's easy to remember, isn't it? It's very practical. Uh, it's very applicable. Uh, the Bible is God's perfect guidebook for living. Then the second one is about loving it or changing our perspective. I can make the right decision. And, and really the fuller statement is because of the Bible, I can make the right decision. Uh, and then the third or the last one is living it out or applying it to our lives. Therefore, I will consult the Bible for guidance in my decisions. And so it's a, the Bible is God's perfect guidebook for living. And therefore, I can make the right decision when I go to it for help. Therefore, I will go to it for help. I will consult it uh, when trying to make decisions in this life. And so there we go uh, with the doctrine of the Bible. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking and praying of, of how to proceed. Um, this is a unique kind of um, Bible study that, that is not necessarily like a verse by verse by verse by verse kind of look at things. And so um, I'm praying about of, of whether to go on into the next doctrine uh, and continue the study as is, or take a break and, and do something else for a little bit, and then come back to the next doctrine uh, after a couple few weeks. And so if you have any uh, insight or thought about that, you're, I invite you to share that with me sometime, and, and share your thoughts with me about that, and, and I'll, I'll make a decision before next week if I want to continue into the next one, uh, or, or do something else for, for a break for a little bit, so... All right, so that's the doctrine of the Bible. Uh, any thoughts or uh, questions or profound statements of wisdom that you'd like to share with us before we close? I hope that, that it's been practical for you in, in actually doing what that objective was and, and helping you to see that the Bible is trustworthy, that the Bible is something that, that came from God. Yes, human people, God used human people to write it, but ultimately it's God's word. And so therefore it is trustworthy. And therefore it should be authoritative for our lives. Not just what we believe, but how we live and how we interact with others, how we, uh, the, how we set our, our convictions, how we set our priorities, how we live out our faith. And so that, that's the, the goal of this first section. All right. If you don't have any profound truth for me, let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we've had to spend time together and, and um, just uh, encourage each other and, and fellowship with each other and uh, study your word together. And so I, I pray that as we go our ways, that, that you would bless every single one here and bless everyone who's watching or who will watch and give us uh, illumination for your word. Uh, we thank you for your revelation. Um, we thank you for your inspiration. Uh, we thank you for your illumination. Uh, we thank you for the truth and the trustworthiness of your word. And give us a, a deeper love for it. Help us to truly value it and truly appreciate it and truly uh, see it for the treasure that it is. And help us to be uh, diligent about spending time studying it. Help us to go to it for answers. Uh, help us to, uh, to try to live it out, to apply it to our lives. So we thank you, Lord, and we, we just, um, we, we're just so thankful for our relationship with you through Jesus. Thank you for our salvation. Uh, give us a heart for other people and help us to um, want to, to minister to other people around us and, and share the truth and share the gospel with them. Give us boldness, courage. Give us the words to say. Give us the, um, the discernment to recognize divine appointments and opportunities. Lord, we, we pray for our church in general. Uh, for every single person who's associated with our church, we pray for their, their health and their well-being and their relationship with you. Um, we pray for, for all of us to be growing in our faith and in our understanding of you. Uh, we pray for 
uh, a vision of, of who you want us to be and what you want us to do. Uh, we pray for uh, creativity and, and how, to, um, how to be an impact in this community and how to uh, spread the kingdom of God in this community. Uh, we pray for unity in our church. We pray for reconciliation in our church. We pray for hope in our church. We pray for, for joy. We pray for passion. Uh, we pray for love. Uh, we pray, Lord, that, that you would just mold us uh, and work in our lives in such a way that, um, that we know, that we know, that we know uh, that, that we're growing in you. So we, we just thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, well, I hope you all have a good rest of the evening and a good rest of the week. Uh, this coming Sunday, we'll be doing the Lord's Supper. Uh, I think it's been a, a pretty good while since we've done the Lord's Supper together. First time since I've been here. So I'm excited to get to share this special time uh, with you doing it. Uh, it'll be probably different than, than you've done in the, than the typical routines in the past with COVID stuff. We'll try to make it you know, COVID friendly uh, of how to do it, but um, uh, it's always meaningful to, to focus on uh, what Christ has done for us and to remember him. And so I hope you'll come and join us uh, for that. So thanks and God bless, and we'll see you soon and very soon. Have you made a decision on Sunday school? Oh yeah, Sunday school, we're going to be in classes. So now we still encourage wear masks and try to social distance and stuff, but um. We're going to try to do it back in our classes. And we're going to do a one call about that, right? So we'll, we'll get the word out. And remind me to do something on Facebook, too, to get the word out, too. Yeah. <laughs>